I want to begin today with a parable. So once upon a time, back in the day when I was traveling a lot to conferences and business meetings all across the country, uh, I would spend a lot of time in the air, over 100,000 miles a year in an airplane. And one time I was flying from Los Angeles to New York for a conference. And being a frequent flyer, I was blessed that on this particular occasion, I got an upgrade to first class. So I'm sitting there in first class, looking forward to the long flight to New York City. And uh, a young man from the back of the plane in the main cabin walks up through the curtain and sits down next to me in first class. <clears throat> well, the flight attendant notices this and comes up to him and says, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, you purchased a ticket for the main cabin. Uh, you can't sit up here in first class. And the young man said, what, you think I'm stupid? Am I stupid? People are always saying I'm stupid. I want you to know I am not stupid. I saw an empty seat. There's an empty seat here. Nobody's sitting in it. I'm going to sit in it. And don't call me stupid. My attendant said, whoa. And I said, if you don't mind... I think I can handle this. Well, I just said, well, okay, sure. So I whispered to the young man. And the young man said, oh, I didn't know that. And he got up and went back to the main cabin. And the flight attendant said, well, what did you say to him that made him go back to the main cabin? I said, I told him that first class isn't going to New York. <laughs> Now, that's a parable. That didn't actually happen. <laughs> it's just a parable that relates to the scripture that we're going to take a look at today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 1, and then examine verses 7 through 14. So that was just to get you started. And now let's go to Luke 14, verse 1, and we'll get the context of our story for today. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. All right, now we know the Pharisees, at least some of them, particularly the rulers among them, uh, did not like Jesus. and They wanted to get him in trouble or find some fault with him uh, to embarrass him in front of the people or in, certainly in front of the Roman authorities. And so Jesus comes here, I think, knowing that this is going on. And notice the conflict is set up on the Sabbath. Oh, my goodness. How many times did Jesus have conflict with the Pharisees over the Sabbath? And he's going to eat with them. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. Food again. That's going to be a conflict. Did he wash his hands? Uh, did he do the right ceremony? So we got Sabbath. We got food. We've got a perfect setting for conflict. And we're just waiting for the conflict to begin. So notice he was eating in the, in the house of a prominent, an archon, a ruler, a leader among the Pharisees, perhaps a member of the Sanhedrin. And it was his house, and he'd invited a lot of people over after the Sabbath. It was a tradition that after a synagogue service on the Sabbath day, that uh, people who could would invite others over for a meal. And that's what this ruler of the Pharisees did. They probably had a big house in a fancy neighborhood, and he had a whole bunch of people over, and he invited Jesus to be one of them. Now, it says that Jesus was being carefully watched. And the Greek verb there implies a nuance of hostile observation. They want Jesus to mess up. They're going to watch him and see just what's he going to do. Can we trip him up? And then if you read this story, all of a sudden, behold, Luke says, a man with edema appears. I bet he didn't get invited normally, but there he was. And to test Jesus to do what? Would he heal on the Sabbath? Well, Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. And now they think they're getting some goods on him. Now, I've got a question. Why did Jesus go? 
He must have known there was going to be conflict. He must have known it was a setup. Why did Jesus go? Well, you know, Jesus did not withdraw from the Pharisees. They may have withdrawn from him, but he did not withdraw from them. He was available. If they wanted him, he made himself available. Did Jesus believe that some might listen to him? Is there just a chance that some might hear him and their lives be changed? But also, Jesus liked to party. Let's not forget that. It's a free meal, folks. It's a free meal, and we're going to party. And, of course, the Pharisees, they said, that Jesus, why, he's a glutton, and he drinks a lot of wine. Jesus like, right on, here I am. Where's the food? Where's the wine? So for a multitude of reasons, possibly, Jesus accepted this invitation to go there. All right, now let's pick up our story in verse 7. When he, that is Jesus, noticed how the guests... Now we're going to find out who these guests were. They were mostly lawyers and other Pharisees. Lawyers and Pharisees. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Now remember, Jesus was being watched closely. (laughs) Jesus is watching them closely too. And what does he notice? Well, these guests, these Pharisees, these lawyers, whoever else was there, they're picking their places at the dinner table. That's not their right. The host tells people where to sit. But these people wanted to pick their own seats out. Hmm, okay. So Jesus tells them this parable. Well, it calls it a parable, but it's kind of like a warning. So here comes the parable, verse 8. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. That's good practical wisdom, isn't it? In fact, it comes right out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verses 6 through 7. That's just just wisdom, you know, that's good practical advice. But what does he mean here? Well, when someone, could he mean God? When someone invites you to a wedding feast, you mean like the marriage supper of the Lamb? You mean like the eschatological messianic banquet? Is that what you have in mind here, Jesus? Is that what you're hinting at? When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. Now, the NIV uses the word honor, but it's actually the word distinguished in the Greek that has the sense of being honored. And remember the culture of the time? Honor, shame. You would do anything to avoid shame. And you would seek more than anything to be honored. Honor and shame. So we're going to see that Jesus plays on that cultural trope. So don't take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you, and remember it's up to the host to decide where people sit, The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Whoa, that's that's, that's a little embarrassing. Give this person your seat. Then humiliated with shame, you will have to take the least important place, the last place. Oh, that's embarrassing. Now, I've got some true airplane stories. You know, it's really terrific when you're sitting in the main cabin and the flight attendant comes to you and says, we have a vacant seat in first class. You've been upgraded. So get your belongings out of the overhead and follow me up to first class. Well, all right then. Yes. Thank you very much. Feels good. I had this happen to me one time, thankfully one time only. I got upgraded to first class. And just before they closed the boarding doors, some VIP comes on board. And the flight attendant comes to me and says, I'm so sorry. He's got a first class ticket. 
you're going to have to go and take your seat back in the main cabin. So you pull your stuff out of the overhead and you do the walk of shame. That's a terrible feeling. So I, I kind of know what this verse is talking about here, kind of having lived through those experiences. So it's better just to take your place in the main cabin and hope than to be seated in first class and told to remove yourself to the back of the plane. Verse 10, Jesus says, But when you are invited, take the lowest place. The literal Greek is fall back. Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, friend, remember the Greco-Roman Judaic culture of the time, a friend, that meant a co-equal, that meant you were equal to the host, you were the host's personal friend, wow, that's nice to hear, friend, move up to a better place, oh, thank you. Then you will be honored. It's so much better to be honored than to be shamed. Been there, done that. So much better to be honored than shamed in the presence of all the other guests. Here's Jesus' point in verse 11. Now, you might say, well, this, this is a technique then that Jesus is saying, some practical advice of how to get upgraded is go take a seat at the foot of the table and wait for the host to come and get you, and you move up. Good strategy. No, he's not talking about a place at a banquet, really. Here's his message. Here's what he's getting across with this parable. For all those who exalt themselves, who raise themselves on high, that's literally what it means, exalt yourself, will be humbled, brought down low. Humbled embarrassed, ashamed. And, but those who humble themselves, bring themselves low. Just go sit at the foot of the table and ha are happy to do that. Thankful to be at the wedding feast at all. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. And what does he mean? By God. Trust God. To exalt you, humble yourself. You take the low position. You do whatever, and trust God, not yourself. Trust God to exalt you, to raise you on high, to elevate you. Now he turns to the host. <clears throat> this is all. This is another thought. Now he's the host has been, has Jesus there to get him. Jesus gets the host. The host is probably thinking, why did I invite this man? This is embarrassing. Verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, chief ruling Pharisee, when you, chief ruling Pharisee, lots of money, big fancy home, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends. Now notice who he's talking to, the chief ruling Pharisee. And the Greek says, stop habitually inviting your friends. In other words, quit inviting the same people all the time. Not, don't ever invite your friends or family over. Just don't do this habitually. Every time you have a, a luncheon or, or a dinner banquet, who do you invite? Your friends, your family, your rich neighbors, because after all, you're a ruling Pharisee, and quid pro quo, I help you out today, you help me out tomorrow. That's who you hobnob with. So he says, do not habitually invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. I want you to notice four categories here. Four categories. Number four is going to be a little bit significant as we go on. Four categories of people. If you do invite them, these four categories of people, they may invite you back. Well, that's the idea. Yeah, one good turn deserves another. They may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. Verse 13. But when you give a banquet, literally a, like a wedding reception, 
When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Do you notice? Four categories. In other words, instead of one, two, three, and four, when you hold a banquet, invite one, two, three, and four. Categories of people. This was a common Greco-Roman term for the needy. In other words, we're talking about people who are needy. He says, if you invite them, you will be blessed. Makarios, happy. You will be blessed. You will be happy. Although, or because, they cannot repay you. They cannot give back. They cannot give back in return. They cannot repay you. You will be repaid, given back in turn. You will be repaid by God. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. At least they got that right. And they'd read scriptures like Daniel 12, verses 2 through 3, that talked about the resurrection of the righteous. And, of course, the Pharisees would hope and expect that that's where they would be in the resurrection of the righteous. And so Jesus is telling them, look, if you take care of the needy, you'll be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous by God at the Messianic banquet. When God holds his banquet, you will be invited to that banquet and you will be repaid with a position of honor and glory. You will be exalted. So what do we learn from this account, from this parable and the story of the host of the banquet? Well, overall, we learn that as disciples of Jesus, we must follow him. And his example of humble self-sacrifice. Jesus was the second person of the Trinity. He's fully God. Can you imagine being fully God and saying, I'm going to become a baby? I'm going to become an embryo. I'm going to become a fetus. I'm going to be born out of a woman as a baby. And I'm going to live in the flesh. For God? You talk about going to the foot of the table. Look at what Jesus did for us. He said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. Wow. What an example for us as his disciples to learn from. So we must follow him self-sacrificing service. And you know what? One day when we do that, we'll be repaid in glory. When Christ comes in glory, we will be repaid in glory. But let's consider three aspects of that. Three aspects about that. Number one, don't exalt yourself. Let God exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Let God exalt you. I'd like for you to imagine a job interview, okay? A job interview. And the job interview goes like this. Question. So, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. The answer. Okay. Uh, let me start with, I'm a wretched sinner. I make lots of mistakes. I frequently say and do wrong things. I sometimes lie. I can be petty and jealous. I've been known to gossip and betray people's trust. And I lack wisdom. And the interviewer says, what makes you believe you're qualified for this job? Uh, well, I'm not qualified. I'm a failure. I'm a failure in life, and I'm desperately in need of help. I'm pretty much lost. What kind of a job could you get with that interview? Well, if Jesus were doing the interview, he would say to you, you're hired. You're just the person I want. Because my whole mission has become to seek and save the lost. And you fit right in. Now, I'm especially hiring the spiritually poor 
the spiritually crippled, the spiritually lame, and the spiritually blind. If you fit any one of those categories, you're hired. You come right on in because that's just who I'm looking for. I've got positions for all of you who fit in that category. Now that leaves out some people who don't think they fit, doesn't it? Yeah. Isn't that the miracle of the divine reversal of God's kingdom from our present evil world? What a reversal. God one day will take all of us who know we belong at the foot of the table and he will raise us up and exalt us in glory. Isn't that an amazing thing? Second point, second aspect of our overall application. We should serve and minister to the needy, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, both the physical and spiritual needy. Whatever time, talent, treasure God has blessed you and me with, it's to be shared with those in need. You know, Luke's writings place a great deal of emphasis on the spiritual importance of sharing possession. This is how we participate in ministry with Jesus. You know, Remember in Luke 4, where Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth and read from Isaiah and said, this is my mission. This is what I've come to do. What was Jesus' mission that he said he had? To preach good news to the poor. To release the captives. To the recovery of sight for the blind. And to let the oppressed go free four categories. The needy, both physically needy and spiritually needy. That's what Jesus came to do. That was his mission. When we join with him, we participate with him, that's what we are doing. We are serving the needy, physically needy and spiritually needy. Now, Jesus is already there ministering to these people. Our job is to Go there and join with him in his ministry. Now, this can mean leaving your comfort zone. <laughs> I can imagine the ruler of the Pharisees when Jesus said, let, let these four groups of people in. He said, like, say what? They might not smell good. They're beneath me. They're lower social standing. It would be inconvenient. I don't like it. But Jesus said, this is what you must do. And it's what we must do to participate with Jesus in what Jesus is doing. And it can mean leaving our comfort zones and going places and interacting with people we would rather not. That's a fact. But it's exactly what Jesus told the Pharisee host of the banquet to do. It's what Jesus commanded him and what Jesus asked of us well. Now, doing that can take many forms and structures. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, it takes many different ways of doing it. The important thing is to do it. You've got to figure out what's needed, how you can do it, and then go about doing it. Now, some would call that an outreach ministry for a congregation, doing outreach ministry. Others would refer to it as the love avenue a journey down a road or a path that leads to loving your neighbor. How do you do that? Well, you have to figure that out. You pray for guidance. You pray for wisdom. You look for opportunities. But at some point, you know you've got to minister to the needy. How are you going to do it? Whatever you call it, whether you call it outreach or whether you call it a love avenue or what, Jesus has called upon us to join with him in his ongoing ministry to the four categories, the spiritual and physical needy. You and I have to figure out how we do that. And as a congregation, you come together and you do your outreach or Love Avenue ministry and you figure out how are we going to participate with Jesus in this activity. All right, third aspect of this overall point, 
overall application is to realize that our repayment and blessing will be fully realized in the resurrection at Christ's return. We will be repaid, but not now. But it will happen one day. When we have walked as Jesus walked, and when we've been led by the mind of Jesus and the attitude of Jesus, we will engage in the work of servants, servants to all people. We'll follow the path of the one who, being God, humbled himself to become flesh, to suffer and die for all. And as we follow that path or that avenue, if you want to call it that, uh, we may have to do some suffering. We may, it may cost us some things. But we'll be repaid. Don't worry about it. Whatever it costs, do it. And we will be repaid. We have that promise. And regardless of our circumstances in the world today, we can, we can have joy and hope. And we can pass that joy and hope on to others who don't yet have it, who don't yet realize it, don't yet experience it. We can pass that on. But we know that our greatest hope and joy is yet to come. In the resurrection, think about it. What will we receive in the resurrection? Well, some like to use the imagery of crowns. You know, the crown that it talks about is, is a Stephanos. It's a wreath, a victory wreath. It's the kind you get when you win a race. They put, in the Greco-Roman culture, they put a, a wreath on your head. That's the symbol of the quote-unquote crowns that we read about. They're victory wreaths. Why? You've won the victory. Why have you won the victory? Is it because you're so fast? No, because Jesus is so fast. Jesus won the victory, and we get to share in his crowns. But what's he going to give us? Spiritual bodies. Oh, I tell you, don't the older you get, the more you go amen to that? <laughs> oh, for that spiritual body. For the fullness of eternal life. We have eternal life now, but the experience the fullness of all eternal life is. Not just a long time, but the quality of life that is beyond our present ability even to comprehend. Fullness of joy. An eternal, intimate relationship with God and with each other for eternity. There can be no greater experience of glory or exaltation for a created being than what we're going to experience in the resurrection. As the song says, you can only imagine. We can only imagine. But can you imagine what it's going to be like to see Jesus? Can you imagine what you're going to see? Can you imagine what it's going to be like to stand face to face with Jesus? Wow. And to see him call out his friends. And Jesus is there and he says, Abraham! Wow, it was so good to see Isaac, Jacob! It's been a long time. David, Elijah! Peter, Paul, Dennis, Jeanette, Frank, Ed, Beverly, Yvonne. He knows your name. Call your name. It's so good to see you and to have you with me. Can you imagine? the joy that is set before us as he welcomes you and me into the house of the Lord. So, for right now, let's all be sure to remember that we should sit at the foot of the table. Always be willing to sit at the foot of the table and wait for the Lord to raise you up and exalt you so high. So, let's move on down. Not move on up. Let's move on down to the end of the table and wait. And one day, our Lord and Master is going to say, Friend, 
Red, come on up into glory and exaltation forever. Amen, amen, amen.